Once again, it's time for Spurdvac Coast to Coast. Time to gather around the radio, computer, or phone and hear fascinating stories from broadcasting and audio pioneers. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's the president of the Society to Preserve and Encourage Radio, Drama, Variety, and Comedy, Tim Knopfler. Thank you, Larry. Oh, and the applause is always wonderful. Thank you. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to our second uh, Zoom meeting for Spurdback. And as of today, the show name is going to be Spurred back coast to coast. Now we recognize there are people in Spurred back who are far outside of our uh, bi-coastal arrangement and everyone of course is welcome. We have an absolutely terrific show for you today. We have Mr. Jack Ward from the Sonic Society and haven't spoken to him a little bit before the show. I am just excited about all the great stuff we're going to cover and that's going to be left to the capable talents of Three men I respect very much, John and Larry Gassman and Walden Hughes. They will be the, the interrogators for finding everything that Jack knows and is willing to share with us. So with that, I turn the show over to our interviewers and take it away. Back to you in the studio, Walden. Thank you, and here are the Wait two a minute, you, you, need the, you, you need the upcut. You need it like it's Bob and Ray, because he said, back to the studio. Thank you very much, Tim. You need to do that. <laughs> Yeah. That's what you need to do. No, Better because, than that. You, know, you know why? Because you didn't want to hear the, the icon, the, the living icon uh, introduction I have for both you and yeah, John. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I listened to you when I was just a little kid. You guys are yeah, the yeah, living yeah, yeah, icon. Yeah, yeah. When this is over. Yeah. Nothing but now, respect. <laughs> if we don't now get respect. You two, now you two, take it away. So, Jack, oh, I sound like I'm doing a Benny program. So, <laughs> so. Which I've done, by the way. So not, a, do, not an actual Jack Benny program. But you did a recreation. I, well, not even that. No? I, I I took a whole bunch of old Jack Benny shows and inserted myself in some strange fever dream as Jack Benny uh, going on in a Christmas special I did years ago because I love Jack <laughs> Benny so much. So oh. you, you can find that on, on the Sonic Society at some point. It's, it's in the feed somewhere. Cool. <laughs> You know, we're talking about radio and old time radio, and and we're going to get into some of the the things that you have done from a new perspective. But but I'm curious as to how much you were aware of and or listened to replays of the old shows. Was that important to you? Oh, uh, very much so. And uh, anyone who I think began in the golden age of modern audio drama way back in the aughts and slightly earlier... um, they 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 see uh, old time radio as definitively one of their main sources, I mm-hmm. think. Mm-hmm. And so you can you can hear that. That's one of the ways you can recognize somebody from the golden age of modern audio drama is how much they respect and how much they appreciate it, how much they try to recreate some of the magic of the old time radio, uh, golden age of old time radio uh, shows. So I, I started off. My parents are both teachers. I lived in a, a small community in, in the rural area. And uh, Christmas, I would get uh, uh, an LP of Buck Rogers or Flash Gordon or Superman. And I was just, our family were, were listeners to begin with. We love CBC radio and I'd get a lot of CBC radio drama as well. But that that sort of started me off on the path of enjoying old time radio and all kinds of uh, radio drama. So what was the link between the old shows that you heard through replays, et cetera, and the idea that maybe it would be fun to create some new time drama? Well, I, um, when I was in university uh, in the late eighties, I, uh, I did do some radio um, shows in the university. They weren't radio drama because that was still tape and there was no way I was going to get myself involved in that. But I did write a couple of scripts that were radio dramas. I don't know what possessed me to do that. I had a friend of mine who was passing me all these old cassettes that he was part of an old time radio group. So he was sending me all of these Sherlock Holmes after he finished listening to, you know, Na- uh, Nigel Bruce and, and uh, Rathbone. Um, Basil Rathbone, and so and 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 the shadow, of course, with Orson Welles and a bunch of others. And so, I, so I think I got excited about that and ended up writing 
sort of my version of Buck Rogers, which I still work on today, and my own detective series, uh, kind of a bit a bit like Candy Matson, but a, a, another female detective by the name of Philippa Graves, a uh, bit of a nod to Philip Marlowe with the first name there. So that they started with that. And then for a decade or two, I nothing happened. Well, not two, but 15 years, nothing happened. And then a friend of mine said there was an internet radio station um, that was looking for content. And he knew how much I loved radio drama. And he said, well, why don't we write a radio drama? And always biting off more than I can chew, I said, why don't we do a series? <laughs> Thinking, this will be easy, right? So sadly, the radio station fell through. This would have been back in about 2004 or so. And I was all excited now because I wanted to do radio drama. So I contacted the local community radio station at Dalhousie University, CKDU, our mothership station. And uh, they had a requirement for a lot of spoken word and they weren't filling it because everybody wanted to be a DJ, but nobody wanted to do spoken word. So for a year, I put up a show or I created a show that we ran on Tuesday nights called Shadowlands Theater because I'm a big Rod Serling fan and uh, the Twilight Zone was still in my head. And so I would play a lot of old time radio shows and then sprinkle them with things that I had created. By that time, I think I wrote about 10 shows that we put together um, and recorded both in that studio and other places. And um, it was so popular around the station. They were saying, well, why don't you try to get this to other radio stations across Canada? We have a, a community and, and uh, university radio network called the NCRA. I think it's the NCRA. And um, they said, why don't you contact them? So I started getting on the phone and calling them. And everybody said, really can't do it. And I said, why not? And they said, well, we don't have the rights to play old time radio like your station does. And I'm like, but if you give us all your original stuff weekly, that'd be fine. I'm like, there's no way I can do a show weekly. So I started looking up on the internet. I was like, there's gotta be other people that are doing this. And it was very slim pickings. Let me tell you back at around 2006, 2007. Um, and I recreated the show and we called it the Sonic Society. And we started to find people. And for a number of years there, the question was, are we going to get enough content to run enough shows every single week for a year? Because there's so little going out there. But little by little, we started finding more and more. And eventually today, even with the Sonic Society 17, 18 years later, uh, we're on the 17th season, but I think for 18 years, um, there's so much, there's no way I could possibly put everything that goes out there on the Sonic Society anymore. The moment, if I knew that, even back in 2012, I don't think I would have believed it because it was really, really hard to find people doing this. And now everybody's doing it. Is it all newly written material or uh, is it stuff that maybe they've taken from older productions and re reworked? It's a bit of a mix, but it's more new material now than it ever was. And that's one of the ways you can tell the definitions, in my opinion. I start Because I started so early on this, I started to notice waves. And so um, I decided to name them the same way we, we sort of looked at the golden age of radio drama uh, and then the silver age of radio drama. And then I would say the modern age of radio drama, which is more of the Bronze Age, which starts the modern age of audio drama, in my opinion. And I started to see similar similar trends going on um, in audio drama. So the golden age of audio drama was people like me who love the old time radio and really wanted to do it. And you saw a lot more people there doing things like a lot of fan fiction they would start off with. So the first couple of years, you saw a ton of people making, like there must have been 12 different companies making Doctor Who shows. And uh, Darker Projects was huge in making Star Trek versions of their own. Like, and they, they were original Star Trek versions, but they were using Star Trek. Even I just uh, put my toes into fan fiction for fun and it got me 25,000 listeners in one year. And I, it's because I created the world's first... Um, fan fiction audio drama of Firefly, the, the science fiction series. And so the Firefly podcast picked it up and called it the second season that never was. And everybody was thrilled about it. And I was thrilled, even though, you know, we were just 
trying to do something for fun. And I was trying to see if I could write a series in that way. So. Talk about your, your productions and how they come about because in, in the olden days, you know, they had a studio audience, they had a stage, they had actors around a microphone up above. They had a booth for engineers. They had sound effects and it's something you probably don't have in abundance sometimes a 15 to 20 to 30 to 40 piece orchestra. But so how did you do what you do? And because of the pandemic, are you still doing it that way or have you evolved and changed? Well, um, those are excellent questions. So I've done a variety of everything um, throughout the years and because I like to experiment and I, I am an omnivore. So I write in all kinds of genres um, I love speculative fiction, so a lot of my stuff ends up being that, but I do, I've done, so I've, I've done live stage shows, live stage recordings, um, I've done stuff here in my, uh, my house, in my apartments, um, throughout the time, and I love working with actors straight on, and then I've done what we called, or at least I called to begin with, I started, because I was so new at this, I was able to name a lot of these things, so we used to call it satellite recording, so we would have people who would just didn't live in the area send us their lines and so um people got to be there were some people that were excellent at this david alt my co-host for the sonic society low these almost 10 years now um maybe longer he uh he's fantastic at being able you send him a script he's able to figure out you know the kind of beats oftentimes even to this day a lot of people that i work with will will send them scripts They'll, they'll read through it and they'll come back with two or three different takes because not all the takes will match up with the people that you're doing. And I'm still asked to, to act that way as well. I rarely act because I'm so concerned about my acting in that respect. As I get older, as I'm more concerned about it. But um, I, it's, I'm, I'm really grateful for people, the people who do ask me to do roles because I, I feel very grateful for that. So that's one way is sort of this... Um, asynchronous kind of acting. And then uh, as of late, I've loved, because I love working with acting at the same time, uh, I've loved doing sort of what Larry does without uh, recording the video where we all get together, usually on Skype because people have Skype, but Zoom's become more popular and Google Meet and all that, whatever we can find. And uh, people will put in their headphones so we don't get bleed over of sound. And then they'll record their own side of things. Or if you have the, the ability, you can record it directly over the internet. But sometimes it's nice to get their original recording locally. And we'll time it. And then people will send their files. And then we'll end up taking those tracks, lining them up, and editing them that way. And for me, that's my preference. Because at least my preference is to work with people directly. Because I think you get a lot more energy uh, when you're working off people. I do. Now, some people don't. And, and I can appreciate that everybody's different that way. But those are the things. And of course, I've worked in an in-studio situation as well. A lot of our original deadline shows were in a couple of different studios. One was in Sonic Temple here in Halifax. And another was at one of the community, uh, community schools here that we have, uh, community college schools. Now, the... The problem exists with commercially oriented shows in, in which you have to worry about copyrights and music rights and so forth and so on. Um, how do you get around that uh, in a podcast situation? So some people honestly don't worry about it. I do, um, of course. Some people sort of wait for for people to, to, to hit them with cease and desist letters. Um, I, I certainly... I. Um, Earlier on, when we were doing um, a lot of work that was old time radio, we would always say to people, you know, we're just doing this for fun. We're not trying to make any money for that. And, and that and that seemed to be OK. But as time goes by and this becomes more and more popular, uh, people are more concerned about making sure they have their own music. There's public domain music that people use. There's all sorts of music that people share. I'm lucky to have a couple of friends of mine that are amazing musicians. Um, some I haven't even worked with yet that I just can't wait to work with, right? Uh, but my longtime collaborator has been a friend of mine that I used to perform with as well. I play the guitar not as much as I used to, but um, she plays the piano and, and has a number of different um, albums out herself. And her name's Sharon B. And so Sharon B has written 
most of the music for all the stuff that we've done. And uh, she's been so kind and generous to be able to produce the music that we have. How much are, let me ask it another way, what percentage of the sound effects that you do are manual versus those that are pre-recorded? Um, again, it really depends on where we're doing it. If we're doing it live, my preference is always to do it manual because I think the visual aspects are really important uh, for an audience to take. If I'm doing it as a recording, more often than not, it's something that's pre-recorded. Lately, I've been taking my little, I didn't have it here, my Zoom, my little Zoom out and uh, recording certain things. I think I gave a sound effect to uh, Larry for one of his shows because it was just such a real, like, it was like my old school that I work at had this really interesting sort of register sound, which made a great background, almost like a boiler room sound, which I'll, I can modify and, and use for science fiction for my Biff Straker series. So, and then recently I, I got a great tin can. It's out, out of reach right now too. And I, I uh, found, followed some instructions online and I put a little, um, spring down the middle and I held the spring down and then I would quiver the spring with the with the the tin can which was sort of like a tomato soup a big tomato or tomato uh, juice can and it would make a really nice reverberation for a sound effect for laser blast so I'm, I'm really trying to record a bunch of those modify them as such so I can have as many of original sound effects as I can I've bought other sound effects from various different sound effects companies in the past and sometimes those two will get nailed by YouTube, putting them on, even though you paid for them. So it, the more you can do the original ones, the better. Question about the, the way, I don't know how you get past this, for instance, but one of, the, one of the perks, obviously, for doing the original drama where everybody was in, in, a, in the same room was that actors could play off of each other based on how somebody read a line. It might be different in one take as as it might be say in another depending on how they read the line if you're in zoom or some other platform and you're not there face to face with the actor how does that work and especially if you're pre-recording the actor because maybe he can't be there for the performance how does that work so the spontaneity and etc is something that's usable and workable and and makes sense it's it takes longer, obviously, to do that. So, for example, um, if I'm doing satellite recording, which a lot of people still do, and that's I send out the script, I tell people about it, try to give them some as much information as possible, and 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 then they come back with takes, and sometimes they just don't work, and you have to say, um, this take didn't work compared to what this person was saying. I want this kind of feeling onto it or whatever, and you ask for retakes, and sometimes if you're clever enough, you can do sort of like a rough edit so that they can hear what the other person is saying and then go, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. I should have paused or whatever it is, put an emphasis on this word and, and you get it back that way. It takes longer to do that in zoom. It's a little easier because you can let stuff go and then you can just say, okay, well, well, well can we take it back four lines? I really need you to do this. Oftentimes when I'm doing zoom or Skype uh, recording, we'll run through it once if we've never done it before, and I'll give them notes after that, uh, if there's a lot of notes to be had. And then the second time we run through it, um, it's usually good. Sometimes I just like to run through it the first time and record both, record as many as possible, because then I've got two or three versions of the show that I can say, oh, you know what? The second time they really hit the line the way I want it. And then when I'm back in post, I can cut that second show version out and put it in the first and and mix and match a little bit it's kind of like you know to a certain degree what they used to do with um like sitcoms you know on on television they would record two versions of them live in front of a studio audience and then they take the best seg segments that had the most laughs at the time the ones that worked the best in in afterwards in post-production kind of works the same way that way so as, a re as it relates to my last question, if you're doing this in Zoom, uh, you're going to have a variety of different equipment being used by performers. I'm using a Hoyle PR40 microphone. Somebody else might not have that. They might have something else completely different. How does that work in the long run? Are you able to play with it in, in post-production so everybody has a like kind of sound, or do you worry about that? 
no uh, for a long time it was one of the biggest problems especially in the golden age of modern audio drama is bad microphones and bad setups and stuff like that um i love um um uh Oh, goodness. Dream Realm Enterprises show, Robots of the Company. Uh, they were a golden age show as well. And they had they solved it perfectly. It was all about robots. So the worst your, your uh, microphone was, it just was an old fashioned uh, robot voice that they could apply to it. So some people had really inventive ways of doing it. A lot of people spent a lot of time like imposing a lot of um, sound, like just um, ambient sound that they would record in their own place to try to sort of even out the sound in between the two it didn't always work and it was more of a problem with the new technology that's coming out now it's incredible some of the things that they can do they have some really cool plugins where they can pull somebody who's got an entirely different sound bed and they sound like they're in the same room with you and so with the better technology is the higher expectations from people when it comes to sound quality so the, the golden age, that was one of the things about the golden age of modern audio drama is that people loved when great sound was put together. And there were some people who did fantastic jobs, people like Stevie K. Farnaby and, and Bill Hulwig and, and uh, Eric Busby. And some of their early productions were just amazing and blew everybody away. But a lot more people who were just thirsty for audio drama were a lot more forgiving back then. Now, not so much. People want to hear it sound like everybody's together. And when you utilize technology like this, it obviously costs money to to put in. Are you using subscription as a basis for the podcast, or how do you how do you gain your income in order to utilize some of these features? I personally, I don't I don't get any of my. This is all straight out of pocket for me because it's it's my joy, it's my fun. Uh, my my Clark Kent job is what pays for anything that I do. So I, I don't have the money to be able to put into it in the same way as other people do. I have to do a lot of do-it-yourself things. Uh, there, there's all sorts of different models that people have done. Some people have their own Patreon account. And so they have the time to do that. I haven't done Patreon because any content I have, I put out there. I, I don't hold anything back for special Patreon people at this point because I don't have the time to do all that. I'm, I'm so busy with everything else. Some people have entire subscription podcasts themselves. and But my, my goal and my purpose from the very beginning was to grow this community, to get bring people back to listening to audio again, and, and to, to be a part of a larger group that provides as much free audio as possible. I've, I've written for paid uh, groups and, and, I, and, and I appreciate them. I'm not saying that they shouldn't do what they're doing. I'm glad that they do. I'm just saying where my, where my heart is right now, um, somewhere down the line, I hope to make some money off of it. But at this point, it's all about building the audience. It's all about letting people know that stories and sound are awesome. Do you have a specific podcast or story that you've written or or even created for a broadcast that you're especially proud of? I can't say honestly that. I, I mean, there's there's so many that I've written throughout the years that I, I feel proud of, but like most writers, I'm most proud of my next project, right? You know, so I, I go back and I listen to things. There goes my lights. One second. I go back and I listen to things, and uh, I discover that, wow, I forgot I wrote that. But certainly, there there are ones that have won awards, and I'm not the kind of person that likes to go out for awards normally. I just want to make the work. But I I'll put stuff out for awards when I feel that people have really gone above and beyond to help me out. And I'm really the award is for them. So we won um, an Ogle Award, uh, honorable mention for um, Soul Survivor. And that was one of my first ones that I felt like, wow, that was that worked out really well. And that was uh, David Alt and um, and and Shannon Hilchey. And uh, John Bell produced that one together. And that was a lot of fun. And then later on, I won a Silver Mark Time Award for um, Alone in the Night, which was a, a Wavefront anthology uh, episode, sort of a science fiction one. And I was really proud of that. And then 
Bob Arnold, who I have the most respect for as uh, from Chatterbox Audio and, and now from Spoken Signal uh, Audio, one of, one of the greats of uh, radio drama and audio drama, as far as I'm concerned. He, for years in Chatterbox, every Halloween, they would have a live show. And he sort of said, could you pass on that we would like people to write scripts and we'll, it'll be a contest and the winners will, will be able to do part of their live shows. So um, I wrote a script for them, uh, sort of a ghost story kind of thing called Tulpa. And uh, they just knocked it out of the park. And so that's, it's funny how certain things that other people have done of my stuff uh, just helps move me the most. I'm, I'm, very, I, I'm very happy to pass off my scripts to other people to produce them um, if, they're, if they're interested, because to me, it's just fascinating to see other people's takes on my work. In just a few moments, we're going to open it up for questions and people will be able to ask. Some already have through chat, etc. But before we do, um, for those who have not heard your work before and want to hear your work, and it's available because we have the Internet, tell us how we can correspond either with you and or your website or find out about what you do. Oh, goodness. I am everywhere. Um, so I've, I've been involved. I, the Sonic Society is just, a, some people are asking, they need to know the differences. So the Sonic Society is a weekly showcase of modern audio drama. It's the longest running show on the internet. Thank you very much, Larry. That's it there. It's the longest running show on the internet when it comes, and the largest showcase of modern audio theater. 18 years we've been going uh, weekly. In the summertime, we have a little bit of a break where we do Sonic Summerstock Playhouse, where we've done almost 12 years, I think, or 13 years of summers of that, where we ask people to recreate old time radio shows with their new groups. So that's kind of fun to do as well. From Sonic Society, I've also got Sonic Speaks, where I do interviewing of people around, and I've had some amazing interviews. And Sonic Echo with my brothers, Jeff Billard. Happy birthday, Jeff. It's his birthday today. And Lothar Tuppen. And we talk about old time radio and Sonic Workshop, which I've only done one or two episodes where we ask people if they want to bring their shows to us they can listen to it. So there's that. Electric Vicuna Productions has been my company name for anything I've personally created. So any, any audio drama I've written and produced, that's there. And you can find the Electric Vicuna Production podcast as part of the Mutual Audio Network as well. And so weekly, I've been releasing all of my shows from the very beginning. I know lots of people from their very earliest shows, they remove them from the feed because they don't want people to listen to them. But to be quite honest, I think everybody can value from even my poorest shows to, to my better shows. So I try to keep everything there. Uh, so, and then most recently the mutual audio network where we release shows every single day. So every day is a different show. And uh, today is Saturday story circles. So it's kids. Sunday is when the Sonic society is on. It's called Sunday showcase. And we have a bunch of different uh, showcases there and Sunday showcase Mondays is Monday matinee with Pete Lutz. Uh, Tuesday is Tuesday Terror with Jeff Billard again. Wednesday Wonders is our award-winning science fiction and fantasy series with Lothar Tuppen. It's award-winning for two years in a row. We've got best blog and or podcast of science fiction and fantasy. Thursday Thrillers with Rich Froelich does uh, crime fiction, thrillers, mystery, adventure. Friday Follies with the amazing John Bell from Bells in the Battery, one of the funniest people I know. And the modern Mel Blanc of, of the modern audio drama uh, world, as far as I know, he does, uh, it's a comedy series. So we have Friday Follies. All of those can be followed. You can get them all on the Mutual Audio Network feed. So the feed will pull every day or you can get them separately. Say you only want a comedy, just subscribe to Friday Follies. It's its own feed as well, its own podcast or Wednesday Wonders or any of the others. On top of that, we also have a podcast where we've taken audio fiction from the story theater. Sharon Grunwald is an amazing actress who, whose hope is to record all of the, the Grimm brothers uh, fairy tales. And so we've taken all of her recordings and put them in story circle theater. I think it's called, yeah, story circle theaters, that podcast. And uh, we've also got a podcast for audio fiction. So uh, books and short stories called the Mutual Audio Book Club. So there's like 11 different podcasts, 12 different podcasts to work from if you want to get that. But if you only want my stuff, if, and that's why I brought up the Electric Vicuna Production Podcast, 
If you're interested in listening to just my stuff, that's where you can find it. Other than that, you'll find it all peppered through the Mutual Audio Network and Sonic Society as I posted on those. You can okay. email me at, uh, at uh, sonicsociety at gmail.com or mutualaudio at gmail.com. Uh, all of those things are available. Or in the Facebook group, Audio Drama, Radio Drama Lovers. I started that from the very beginning. I also have uh, the Sonic Society and the Electric Vicuna Production Podcast. There's my website for Electric Vicuna Production Podcast at evicuna.com. And also I have jackjward.com where I write down various different ideas of as a writer for that respect through the audio medium. So, so, so let me, let me go back just a second here because there are people listening to this at a later time and not seeing the screen. There are three of us here who are totally blind, who will not see the screen. Fair enough. So if, if you had one address to give so that somebody could contact the website to learn about everything you just mentioned, what would it be? Probably the Sonic Society. So sonicsociety.org. Okay. Uh -huh. You can find uh, links to who I am. Uh, you can find links to almost all the shows, including you can find links to NADSRIM. Uh, NADSRIM is the National Audio Drama Writers Month. I sort of decided to pick something just like we have with um, the National Novel Writers, um, NaNoWriMo, in November. I decided let's have a, a time for script writing for audio drama. So I made it the month of February, the shortest month and the darkest month of the year. So uh, people can go to uh, go to that link and uh, they can try and write something in the month of, of February as well. So you got it all covered. It's audience right. participation as well. Oh, I, I, the more people that are involved, the better. And uh, I'm, I'm a very uh, introverted person generally, but I love creating a creative community because I learn from everybody, all the people that I named and there's so many more like that, that I named all those people who are hosts in the mutual audio network. They're all my friends and they're fantastic. And every time I get a new intro from, for their hosting for the show, I'm just so inspired by to write and to produce and to include them as actors. And, and I, the, the more I work with people, the happier I am. So it's a wonderful place to be. Jack, we want to thank you for being with us. Don't go anywhere because there are questions coming. But okay. it's been like it's been fun. It's been enjoyable, and I've listened to a lot of your stuff and enjoyed it. Oh, thank uh, you. And, and I haven't had a chance to hear it lately because work and other things got in the way. Sure. But not for long because I do know my priorities. Thank you, Larry. But thank you very much. It's been a delightful half hour, and and we're going to turn it back to Larry and to uh, Tim, and questions that others have had because I've seen them come in through the chat. And we'll enjoy that, too. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. And we're going to let J uh, Zach uh, be our question and answer man. He's He's been compiling all the questions. Yes, so, I Zach, have. I'm going to let you uh, start reeling some of them off. And I know that, except I'm going to ask the first one. Because sure. there was one topic we did not get to. You said, you know, gosh, all the things you're doing. And you left out the most recent uh, project of all, Jack, that you are uh, working on. And that would have to be MadCon. Tell us about that. So, um, sadly, Bill Hulwig, who is a huge inspiration for all of us, um, passed away a couple of years ago. And uh, that's when I became really close to Lothar Topfen and, and Jeffrey Billard and, and Bill's daughter, uh, Bailey. And uh, we went and scattered his ashes. And I, I came back from the plane very transformed by that experience. And I thought, how I met these people that I've never met before. How, how can we get together and do stuff? Because we do these things in different corners for the longest part and, and very, we're lucky if we even see each other. So I thought, well, there's never been a modern audio drama convention to my knowledge. There's been podcast conventions. There's been old time radio conventions. There's been science fiction conventions such as included audio drama, but there's never been strictly an audio drama, modern audio drama convention. So I came up with the idea of doing MadCon on 2020 here in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And of course, uh, things got in the way of that, right? So uh, we, we had a pandemic, we're still in a pandemic. I'm at a point right now um, that if things are still as iffy as they are, that maybe I, I might want to focus on removing the massive a massive uh, conference now and have people 
try to focus on helping people work together with smaller conventions in their area to build towards when we can all get together again. Because uh, it's important to me. There's a lot of people that uh, I really want to meet, people I've worked with. Uh, I would love to see face to face. And so whether it, it happens this summer in Halifax or not, I, I intend it to happen at some point in Halifax. If it can't this summer, then I'm going to try to push for people in their local areas to start getting together and, and doing smaller groups of that. But you can go to mad-con.com and get all the information. This last summer, somebody said, why don't you do it virtually? So we had an incredible turnout. Uh, we did six different sessions for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday uh, in July, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, I believe. And I broke it down because I wanted it to be a, like a workshop in many ways. So even though everybody was talking, Friday was all about writing and creation. Saturday was all about recording and getting your team together. And Sunday was all about post-production and releases. And I think we have, and, and they're all on the Mutual Audio Network YouTube that people can find and listen to them now. So I, I, I get, got them all out, even if you couldn't watch it live at the time, you can go back and look at them. And there's some amazing, some people have said it's like a master's class in audio drama. And that's not because of me, that's because of all the great people who were working there. Wonderful. So now we're gonna go to some questions from the audience, Jack. Which, by the way, thank you for uh, spreading a lot of that love for creative groups getting together. That's uh, something that I uh, hold dear to my heart. I appreciate that a lot. Um, oh, I'm a I've proud member of Spurred Back. I have to say that. I Since I found you guys <laughs> about a, a couple of years ago, I'm so grateful to be able to go through a lot of the old time radio scripts that you guys have and just to, to see the stuff. I was so disappointed that I can't, I don't get a radiogram. I would love to have a radiogram, but being in Canada, I guess it's harder to post those. So that's under discussion. I think you're going to get a PDF. Oh, that would be nice. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry to the questions. Yes, absolutely. So Craig um, says, Jack, if you recall, we worked together a few years back. I believe I furnished some Quicksilver shows for your project, setting audio dramas to service people overseas, modern AFRS. You want to elaborate on that, Mr. Craig, Jack? Craig Witchman. Yeah, yep. Craig. Oh, Craig, 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 it's great to hear from you. I would love you to be involved in Mutual Audio Network, by the way. We're looking for all the great old time radios because we have so much need for content and uh, we replay everybody's stuff. So we want to fit that in. So, oh God, Quicksilver, I miss you guys. That's great. Yeah. At one point we were trying to get together and get a bunch of people to donate some stuff. This was sort of a, a setup from Jeff Adams. He had the idea during sort of uh, one of the Gulf War and Af Afghanistan uh, detachments, maybe we could get a CD out and stuff like that. We got caught up with people. Some people didn't send stuff in in time, the editing process that by that time, everything people were called back from the service. We didn't have the right kind of connection. So sadly that didn't happen. There's been a couple of false starts for things i know i did sonic gold one of my attempts to try to be able to make money to do that that didn't work out either as well but you try these things you throw whatever you can up against the wall and see what sticks and learn from it fantastic and then we'll go ahead and move on to a question from our own tim he's got a couple here um let's start with the first one what do you think the biggest challenge is to introducing new audiences to performed audio arts uh, the biggest the biggest challenge and as a teacher i have this biggest challenge as well it's getting better it's getting so much easier but people are not used to just listening to stories anymore so mm -hmm. we become such a visual world especially with streaming and 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 youtube and all that kind of stuff um it it's it's a it's an intelligence it's a language it's an understanding it's a way of being able to you really have to build up the muscle to be a good listener to be able to catch stuff I think that's why so much highly narrative stuff. So you'll find a lot more highly narrative stuff in the third wave, which is the current wave of the modern audio drama movement, um, the Bronze Age. There's a lot more first person narrative stuff where people do a lot more talking uh, to try to explain stuff. Whereas um, many people from the Golden Age, even though you can have a, a, you know, a strong narrator 
We're more interested in the immediacy of the audio of the radio drama and the audio drama where mm -hmm. you can be thrown into the story that can get lost for people. So people have to be listening for sound effects. People have to be listening for for a bunch of different things. And it, like I said, it's a, it's a skill. You really have to develop it. And that's the biggest problem is getting people past the fact that there's no visuals. It's it's interesting to hear, and I, I I agree. There is a there is a lack of um, appreciation for how that uh, art form is spread and how it's received, especially which hopefully podcasting in itself is helping develop those skills further for listeners as time goes on and marches forward as it as it must. Um, another question: Given the, your depth of experience, share with us what influenced you the most from the original War of the Worlds broadcast. What was it that followed you into your productions? Uh, I, by the way, I just listened to Reimagined Radio's new War of the Worlds, and they're my new Ooh. friends. Reimagined Radio—they're great guys. I didn't know anything about them, and John and Mark. I shouldn't say Mark and I have, have talked years ago, and uh, their new War of the Worlds, which will be out on the Sonic Society on. Uh, Halloween day because that runs on a Sunday so Sunday showcase nice. listen for that there powerful stuff there's there's um there's been some shows that have just almost haunted me and uh, I know I had a a list of my some of my favorite shows um that that have have inspired me throughout the years um and there's more and more so when I when I listen when we do shows in Sonic Echo right now uh, Lothar Jeff and I we're trying to doing themes. Last year, we we focused on westerns, old time radio westerns, mm -hmm. and um, and the, the Jimmy Stewart um, um, show, which six I shooter. the six shooter. Thank you, the six shooter, and of course, um, uh, Gunsmoke, and all those kind. Those ones just so powerful. Now we're looking at noir, and we're we're trying to take a deep dive on some of those shows. And there's some really really cool things that have happened when it comes to sort of modern age i have been so grateful to meet some of the great people one of my favorites is uh is um um colonial radio theater with jerry robbins and um he's not making as much audio drama now but for 25 years he's been making uh audio drama you can buy and so a lot of people will recognize the name uh, powder river which is his longest running western series but one of his most powerful ones for me was the one man show that he had done with William Luce uh, called Barrymore. And uh, he made it for audio drama. And it was just it was just incredibly powerful as a, as a show. Um, another great uh, producer, writer who, who's moved on to movies, but did some incredible work was uh, a guy named Billy Sinise. And he wrote uh, Midnight Radio Theater. And uh, when I have students today, now I have to wait till they're grade 12 because there's some adult situations in some of these things, but uh, they'll say, oh, you know, I don't believe radio drama can, you know, really scare me or anything. I'm like, okay, here is your challenge. Go and listen to the woman in the basement, but you have to listen to it with all your lights off in your bedroom and your phone turned upside down and don't turn it off. And I would say about 30% of those students who come back go, Mr. Ward, I couldn't finish it. I was, I was too scared. I couldn't finish the show. So that was powerful. Um, I, I was really inspired by one of my first radio dramas that I produced was called Right Number, Wrong Party. And it's a, we just finished 20th anniversary. Lothar Tuppen produced that for me. And it was inspired by uh, Lucille Fletcher's Sorry, Wrong Number, which was, of course, a, a great classic from the suspense days. And um, Crazy Dog Audio had some great stuff from Roger Gregg out of Ireland. And one of my favorites was Jerry and the Dark Passage. So there's a bunch of, oh, and of course, I, I can't go on without mentioning uh, one of my, one of the guys who started with me at the same time, another Canadian, uh, Greg Taylor, who's, who's the writing maniac behind Dakota Ring Theater, who would write a show every other week and, and had, have a new show produced every other week, and then talk to me on the phone about how concerned he was because his wife was going to have a baby, and he only had a, a year and a half in the can. <laughs> a year and a half in the can? What are you talking about? <laughs> so there's tons out there, and I, and I, I, I regret to say, oh, Dirk Meggs. 
uh, and his work uh, was so inspirational and still is. What a great producer he is doing Hitchhiker, the new Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. He did things like uh, Batman Nightfall and a bunch of other fantastic stuff. More recently, an Alien series, which was better than the movie that came out. Just there's some really amazing people out there. Absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's a whole group of folks that I need to start discovering for myself as well. Like that just gives me more reasons to keep listening to these things. Like there's so many sure. other different vari var variations of what people are doing and how they're approaching the art form. Um, and that actually leads us to a question uh, from our own Bob Tevis. He wants to know, since Jack lives in Canada, can he give us some insights on Canadian radio? Do they still support radio drama like the BBC does? Heartbreakingly, no. Um, I, I talked to uh, year, some years ago, because that's one of my dreams is to have my stuff on CBC. I've loved it so much. Uh, and I just did a series. I don't know if you're familiar with Nightfall, uh, one of the best CBC radio series back in the 80s. It's a chiller. It's, it's, a hollow, chiller. it's a chiller thing. Every, it's, every episode's like that. And it's, it's really, really done. It's, it's yeah. probably uh, a really good example of old time radio done in a modern style right. uh, with people who, in fact, the people who wrote it, the guy who created it, he said he wanted to do rock and roll radio drama. So, um, and, and there's like John Ballantyne, fantastic producer today uh, from the States considers uh, Nightfall to be the thing that inspired him to make Campfire Radio Theater, which is another grand series. We got to listen to Campfire Radio Theater, Bill of Horror. Um, regardless, um, I talked to a lady and they were doing a show called deep night, I think. And then it got canceled. And I said, well, how do I go about it? And she said, well, sadly, we don't do radio drama anymore. And I said, well, why not? And they said, well, we sell it. We, we have midnight cab. We have Alice in cyberspace. We have all these fantastic radio drama shows that we sell on tapes to the U S but the money doesn't go back into the radio drama pocket back in cbc it just gets dispersed to cbc so radio drama is always poor and because they had such a really great deal with the actors through the actors union they couldn't afford to re to to put the stuff out again even on the radio itself because they didn't have the money to be able to do that so a lot of that stuff got lost got put away forever so a lot of the shows that i grew up with like there was a great kids show that i loved called johnny chase secret agent of space of outer space. And it was on every Saturday. I, I asked them, I said, well, how much would it cost me to, to, to buy it? And she said, I think I could sell them for you per episode at $9.99. I said, $10 a 25 minute. I don't think it was 20 minute episode. I, I, I can't afford the 75 episodes that it is. That's not realistic for, for that. And, and so they didn't even know how to market it in the same way. And like they could, you could have put together a, a great $29.95 for a season, right? And people would have bought them by season for sure. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, so sadly, there's not a lot. Now, recently, another heartbreak for me, um, there's, there's, there is a podcast out of CBC right now where they're doing brand new playwrights. It's not on CBC radio. I forget what it's called probably blocked it from my mind because I had hit my head against the wall for so many years. <laughs> but they, they do CBC radio playwrights and they do radio drama from that. I don't know if it's still going. I know it was an experiment. Um, and I had talked to the people who were involved in that and they were newcomers to the audio drama world. They went, wow, this is a pretty cool place. And I'm like, yeah, it really is. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's hard to find stuff. Sadly, BBC is, is still the stalwart to be able to create that work. it because whoops Zach you cut You're out buffering that. a lot it's not just me then that's good no all right I'll, tell I'll, you go, it was. I'll, I'll go in for Zach I'll, I'll speak for Zach here we have another one here uh, another question if you could go back in time and produce any show from the golden age of radio what would it be and why oh god oh, okay you can pick two so hard <laughs> Oh, there's so many. This is like saying, you know, what is your favorite? What is your favorite uh, song or your favorite thing? Like my my kids always say, you know, what's your favorite movie? I'm like, no, you have to give me a genre because I can't go down a favorite movie. Um, uh, well, I will tell you this: that for fun, some friends of and I are see Bill Holwig 
my, my friend who passed away, used to always send us Temple of Vampires. So oh, that I was love a mystery, yeah. Yeah, I love a mystery yeah. series. It was his mm-hmm. favorite series, and it was a lot of fun. And uh, Carlton Morse, Carlton E. Morse wrote right. those. And and so for fun, we are putting together our own version of it. And um just between us for now, and it's just so much fun recording that and having fun with it with my my friends, and we're really, really loving that. In fact, I love it so much that I kind of like I'm I'm writing my own sort of inspired series called adventures by north instead of adventures by morse <laughs> and so it's a, it's, it's a action t- a team back in the 1920s and 30s in canada and they go on various adventures and trying to write in the same kind of style as carlton e morse so there's that of course um i would love to do anything by mercury theater on the air and wells has always been sort of a spiritual uh father of mine <laughs> so no problem, Zach. Oh, and Craig, again, <laughs> back quick silver. Craig, email me. I want to talk to you about that stuff at mutualaudio at, at gmail.com if you're interested. I'm Gay sure Carter, he is. Gay Carter asks about someone. Uh, uh, you mentioned a new Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, cool. tell, tell us more about that. What was that? So Dirk Meggs um, was, has been involved in doing like the live show of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy for a long time. And I think he's done a new series that was written um, written basically some on some of the notes by douglas adams or by people who can c- continue the series i haven't heard it myself yet there's so much to listen to um but yes um i would go look for dirk meggs uh, it's d-i-r-k m i think it's m-a-g-g-s or i don't think it's m-e i think it's m-e-m-a-g-g-s i would yeah yeah m-a-g-g-s and um and just start searching for his stuff um, you can buy some of it outright. It's usually through the BBC. Um, that's where he, he does a lot of his work from his company. There you go. Later, based on the later books in the series. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate that. All right. Well, Jack, thank you uh, very much. It has been uh, probably the quickest hour I can remember in, in a long time. We're talking about, I mean, you've given us a fair portion of your day in preparation and getting ready for this, and and uh, you've made sizable contributions to the audio art. So we were thinking, what can we do for Jack? What would be meaningful? And several ideas are tossed around, like, do we buy Jack a car? Do we get him a cruise to some place? And we thought, you know what? Anybody can get a car and anybody can get a cruise, but not everybody can get a Friends of Spurdvac award. So this is what we decided to do. So, oh. so Jack, in recognition for your contribution to preserve and encourage all the best in radio drama and for your participation in supporting events, we award and bestow you the Friends of Spurdvac Award today, 16 October 2021. Oh, I will put this on my wall. Thank you so much. It will be, it will be uh, mailed to you. Uh, with, a, with a signature, I'm not sure if that will devalue it, but we'll. But uh, you know, uh, in all in all candor, um, you have become a hub to something that would have uh, rolled to the side of the road and died uh, had you not put your gifts and talents and skills to it. You know, we're um, um, Sonic Society and Spurred back a great number of things in common, and we anticipate that we'll be doing a lot more together as we have complementary goals and capabilities and resources and desires and who knows what it'll hold but uh, certainly the the e part of spurred back to encourage you have been uh, doing great guns so as a as a personal thank you uh we are we're grateful for all that you do and uh, we hope to have you around again and to update us on the, the new um shows and activities that you're involved in and um as we have a new website launching soon um it's our hope and our desire to include a directory which will uh, identify your group as a resource for you know as we can get people used to listening and as a teacher you know the only teaching that counts is the teaching that changes behavior and getting people to recognize that what you get by listening to a show versus watching is one is absolutely passive and one is active. One uses your brain and the other one doesn't. And 
getting people to recognize that they get more from audio than they'll ever get visually is part of the challenge that lies in front of both of us. So we look forward to meeting that challenge with you. Thank you and so, much. So, um, so thank you. Um, we have upcoming next month on 13 November, uh, singer, writer, actor, Mr. Don Hastings um, will be joining us for Spurdvat Coast to Coast. And um, is uh, Larry, is it the same time at one o'clock? On, yes, uh, it is. Okay, one o'clock. And um, it's a, you know, it's, it's what a joy to have, uh, have Don with us. It's going to be a, a lot of fun. I would like to take a moment and thank our show producer, Larry Groby. And I also want to thank our technical director, um, Mr. Zach Eastman, for doing their absolutely wonderful and usually fabulous job in putting this together, making it look so easy. I would like to thank our hosts, uh, Larry Gassman, not Glassman, Larry Gassman, John <laughs> Gassman. And uh, that was a typo that went out, but that's, you know, all part Does of John have an L in his name, too? Um, <laughs> you'll have to ask him. Oh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not looking at him. By the way, I should, I should, I need to mention since we are worldwide that that one o'clock time that I just mentioned is Pacific, so it's four Eastern, one Pacific next right. month. Thank you very much. An important uh, uh, identifier there. Um, let's see what else do we have. Um, Walden, if you're still with us, I know that you had um, some technical things you were dealing with. Um, you said you'd be. Uh, uh, dealing with uh, some some cable issues today, but um, if you're not there, at least on the recording, we want to thank you for uh, putting this together. Uh, I also want to thank uh, all of the Spurjack members who have chosen to join us here today. Uh, this show is for you. It is a, a resource that we can put together and provide to you, uh, largely based on your request for us to do all that we can. And um, we're grateful for the opportunity. So uh, unless there are any closing comments, anybody? I, I, I have one little thing that I forgot to mention that I should. There's so many things, so many things I can't mention, but I, I noticed that, uh, that Pete Lutz is a member as well. And he just mentioned in the Q&A, transcontinental terror every Sunday in October, we're, we're doing horror shows and, and Pete and, and John Bell are the hosts. And again, I, I'm just the tip of the iceberg here. I'm so grateful to be a part of all these people. And it, so ev you, every Sunday you'll hear three or four brand new uh, horror shows uh, on, on a Sunday showcase and the Mutual Audio Network feed. Sorry about the extra bit, but I-, I Oh, that. you know, it's all, uh, it's all good stuff. We're happy to have it. Now it's on the recording and that'll be available as people uh, uh, review the show. Okay, well, with that, I would like to thank all of you for attending spurred that coast to coast our second show and um it's been just a joy and a privilege to present this to you i want to wish you a safe and happy saturday and until next time stay safe and stay tuned